Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. We have been working on this gentleman's 8-ball deluxe limited edition pinball machine. Uh, we did a couple videos on it already. He basically he took it apart. Um, he found it in pretty rough shape. Took it all apart. Redid the play field with a new overlay. Um, took all the wiring out and everything. So we've been putting all of that back. Um... So if you didn't see those two videos, go check it out. On the last one, we put in some sockets that were missing off of the lamp, the light baffle in the back box that he uh, that he had to remake. And uh, we've got it up to the point where we're trying to work our way through it and get the thing up and actually playing. So on the first video, at the end of it, we got some light bulbs to come on. On the second video, we didn't plug anything in because we started putting in more of the harness. And we ended up up to the back where we had to reinstall the... Uh, the wiring on the back of this board, like I said, right? So we're to the point now where we need to plug the play field into the power supply and see if the lights work on the play field. And then we need to work through the machine uh, like we usually do the power supply, the solenoid board, then the MPU and all of the boards, right? So we've got some things plugged in right now. We haven't turned it on or anything. We were just doing that to make sure that we routed the wires into the proper place. Uh, of course, we've got the display and all of the displays and all of that. So the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to pop the glass out and raise up the play field so that we can look at the power supply, which in 8-Ball uh, Deluxe is down at the bottom of the game. Or I should say 8-Ball Deluxe Limited Edition is down at the bottom of the game. Um, I don't remember if 8-Ball Deluxe has it in the bottom or in the back box, but... If you don't know about this game, this is the limited edition version of it where they were trying to use these cabinets that they had uh, that they had used to make Rapid Fire. And Rapid Fire didn't sell very well, so they had a whole ton of extra cabinets. So they made this game just so that they could use the smaller head and everything. 8-Ball um, was the best-selling game of all time. The original 8-Ball. So pool themes do really well. So after they did that, they made 8-Ball Deluxe, which was just an awesome game. It's so awesome that I actually have the back glass hanging up on the wall here in my showroom. So, you know, that was a very famous game. It was also a very well-selling game. So that one made them a fortune. And so they, whenever they had all these extra cabinets, they said, hey, let's just make some more 8-Ball Deluxes. Uh, but since it used the different cabinet with the weird head, they redesigned the back glass a little bit, and they called it 8-Ball Deluxe. They did the same thing with Mr. and Mrs. Pac-Man, and they did the same thing with Centaur 2. So uh, if you find one of those or a rapid fire, you will have this strange-looking cabinet. So let's get the glass out of it. We'll tip up the play field, like I said, and look at the power supply again. So this play fit has a whole bunch of wires that go up to the boards in the back box, and it has one plug here that actually plugs into the power supply. Now the power supply is a Golf Pinball brand new power supply. So it should be fine. We will find out. Um, I've used those before. It's a good company. They make good stuff. It's really, it's a simple design. I'm not saying this to insult them or anything it, it, you know this isn't something hard to make it if you um, I'm sure they have other things that are much more complex but um, it's a good product because the original design was pretty good and they've they've pretty much stuck with the original design they changed a couple things but it's you know they did it right so it has this one plug that's going to plug in there that's going to send it the voltages that the lamps need and it's going to send it the voltages that the coils need, right? Now the boards in the back box will ground the lamps to turn them on and ground the solenoids to turn them on. The switches are controlled by the boards in the back, so they don't have anything to do with the power supply. So what we need to do is just look at this play field and make sure there's no big no-nos, you know. Now I believe, no-nos, you know, I believe if you look... I don't think the customer really did too much on the bottom of the play field. I think he was good to go on that. He just put a overlay on the top of the play field, which means he probably took a lot of this stuff off that goes through the play field. But uh, stuff like the lamps and stuff are probably right where they originally were. 
Now the only thing that the power supply is concerned with on the lamps are the general illumination lamps, the ones that are always on. Um, oh, another thing I should mention. You may have noticed if you're an eagle-eyed viewer that this is the wrong transformer for this game. This is an 8-ball deluxe limited edition and there is supposed to be a different transformer with a separate tap on it that comes out and attaches to some stuff that would have been here. This is a, a ballast for a fluorescent lamp and this is a starter holder for a fluorescent lamp. Uh, originally this game had a fluorescent lamp on the back box that would illuminate the uh, the uh, back glass. But uh, it's been removed from this one because that that original head was destroyed or screwed up or whatever. So he doesn't need that. And he thought we talked with the customer. He thought that he had a problem with his transformer, so he found another one and put it in. Um, however, it seems like that there wasn't a problem with the other transformer. But we're going to leave it like this because we're not going to put the fluorescent lamp back in. Uh, we're going to put some LED strips back there to illuminate the back glass. And those only need, I think, 12 volts. They might be 5 volts. So, that's that. So we're, go we're going to look and just see if, the, if it looks like there's anything that's a problem. Something that's been smashed. Something that's been soldered in the wrong place. A broken wire that's hanging and touching the wrong thing. I don't see anything like that. We're concerned with our coils. And our lamps, basically. Uh, everything looks pretty good. Everything looks, you know, basically factory. This is how you would want it. Yeah. So I was thinking that kind of almost looked like those had been smashed down. But if you look, the contacts are not touching. That's actually fine. Uh, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with anything. It looks good. So this is a solenoid expander board. Basically, if this relay is on, wiring goes one place. If the relay is off, wiring goes another place. So by doing that, by having the, the software turn this relay on or off, you can control more than one solenoid with the same wires. So let's say that you had four pop bumpers over here and four pop bumpers over here. You could wire up eight pop bumpers with five uh, solenoid lines, right? Because you could tell this, you could not turn this on and these four pop bumpers would work. Or you could turn this on and then those same lines, instead of making these four pop bumpers work, would make these four pop bumpers work. And you could do it real quick. So you could have eight pop bumpers working off of five lines instead of eight lines. Um, they had these little boards that they mounted the lamps to. All of those are computer controlled lamps. Um, there's some fuses there. Everything looks good. I don't. Nothing has been messed with on this. So this is just all how it originally was. Sometimes on the edge of the board, you'll see a problem because see the, see this rub mark here, and then you see another one here. What happens is on some games when you lay it down, it lays on the wires if they're in the wrong spot. But if you look at this game. See that little metal thing there? That's where the, the play field is going to lay. And then on the back, it lays there and kind of hooks under here. Right? So the way this is designed, most of this edge doesn't touch anything. So that doesn't. That doesn't. So even under there's wires there, it's, there's nothing for it to touch. So they're fine. But if, you, if you've got a machine that's blowing fuses or something, that's one of the places you want to look. What do you all think? I think everything looks fine. I don't like that, but that's minor. Okay, so see how that blade is turned over? You could potentially have that touch the frame. And then if something else was touching the frame or the screw was energized or something that might cause problems so we'll carefully try to bend that back without breaking it 
But yeah, so that's all I found wrong with it. <laughs> Looks pretty good. So I think we're safe to plug the playfield into the power supply. Uh, and then we'll go from there. So you can see how good these things look once they have a new overlay on them. Really nice. He did a great job putting it on too. It's nice and flat. Everything looks clean. We've been keeping the glass on it to keep the dust off of it. We haven't installed this back yet for whatever reason. He didn't have that on there, but we can put that back. Um, so, pretty cool. So, I have disconnected all of the power going to everything. So, the power for this ma machine comes in here. The power for the SolarWinds driver board. The power for this board comes in here. The power for the lamp board comes in there. <laughs> the power for the auxiliary lamp board comes in there. The power for the squawk and talk comes in there. And the displays are not plugged in. So, nothing, uh, nothing has power with the exception of the coin door bulbs and the play field. Um, now, again, on the play field, it's just going to be the general illumination. He's put LED bulbs in here. So these are the ones that will light up. I don't know if on this particular game, if they had a relay to turn the LEDs, I mean the uh, general illumination on and off or not. So uh, I might look at the schematics for that. But... I've got everything unplugged, so I think we're ready to plug it up and just see if the play field will light up. So I've plugged it in. We're going to do a smoke test. Now a smoke test is literally how it sounds. You turn it on and see if anything catches on fire. The voltage for the uh, lights is 6 volts AC, so not that big of a deal. The voltage for the solenoids, I think, is 30 volts, something like that. 30, I always get 40 volts. They're all different on everything. It doesn't really, the specific doesn't really matter. I think it's 40 volts uh, or something like that. Um, but the 40 volts is enough to screw something up. The 6 volts, it'll just probably blow a fuse. Um, the solenoid, since we don't have anything plugged into this solenoid driver board, that's all the grounds of the solenoid. So basically one half of each solenoid is unplugged. So they shouldn't do anything. But they might do something if something's screwed up, if a wire's in the wrong place. I mean, this is a machine that's been completely disassembled, and we're trying to put it back. And then, I, you know, I've also got this stuff up here that I did and all that. So, if something's wrong, the wire's in the wrong spot, you might end up with something bad. So, we're just going to turn it on real quick. Or, you can go slow, but we're going to turn it on and very quickly look to see if anything bad's happening. If we see anything bad happening, we're going to turn it right back off. But hopefully we'll be fine. So here we go. Looks good to me. I don't see any smoke or nothing. I think we're cool. Alright, so we've got... These, these sockets are notorious. For being bad. The ones that hold the 555 bulbs. We've got all these, but they could be something that lights up or something, I'm not sure. Yeah, as I go around and touch them, they're turning on. I got the magic touch. Um, I'll show you this socket here. They're just not great at gripping the bulbs. You gotta mess with the bulbs a little bit sometimes. Bend the wires out so that they make better contact, something like that. So. Uh, but, you know, all of that we can do whenever we finish it all up. But for now, we know that the lamps are working. We've got the lamps turning on on the coin door, the lamps turning on on the uh, play field and again th there was originally a fluorescent lamp that turned on on the back box we don't have it installed uh, I think there is maybe one or two more general illumination lights on the display or maybe not on this one but so anyway all of that seems to be working 
So the next thing that we need to do is test the voltages coming out of that power supply just to make sure that they're correct before we send them up here to this solenoid driver board. All right, so we had a customer send us this sweet fluke multimeter, by the way, um, that he used in some of his videos. He sent it to us so that we could do stuff like this so y'all would be able to see it. So everybody thank our wonderful customer. Um, I'm going to carefully check these. I should have put the play field all the way up, but I think we can make it. I think we can make it happen. And it says on this golf pinball board exactly what the voltages should be. So this says 6.5 volts DC. 7.59. Now, the reason for that is because it's unregulated. 11.9 volts DC. Hmm. Let's give it a 6. We'll see if that changes when we plug in the uh, other end. There's your, there's your solenoid voltages I was wondering about, 43. Uh, this should be 230. It's low because it's the display voltage. That's pretty typical. And then the AC should be 6.5, 6.4. The only one I'm concerned about is the 12 volts is... 7.5 but I think I've seen that before where without the solenoid driver board in for some reason it does that I don't know might be a thing might not be a thing but since it's not higher we're gonna run with it just to test it so that 12 volts goes up to the solenoid driver board and gets rectified into 5 volts um, or not rectified but uh, regulated into 5 volts so it really should be 12 uh, so I don't know why it would not be without the without it plugged in maybe there's a I know there's a capacitor up there but maybe that raises the voltage or something um, but we'll, pl we'll try plugging it in and then retest it you can also test it on that board if we measured that and it was 40 or something instead of a set of 11.9 then I wouldn't plug it in and I'd try to figure out what was going on but since it's low, it's not going to hurt anything. It's just you might not get, if you don't have your 12 volts, you might not get your 5 volts out the other end of it. Um, so we'll roll with that. But just we'll keep in our, in our mind that that one seems off. Now the other one seemed off too, the very first one, which was 6, whatever, 6.5 uh, 6 volts DC, and it was 7 something. That's the voltage that the... Uh, the lamp board uses for the computer controlled lamps and none of those are plugged in right now so there's no load on that line so it might be high because of that uh, so that one doesn't worry me too much the other ones were pretty good oh the display voltage it's supposed to be 230 but it's only 180 or whatever it was that's really typical that's because there is a capacitor on the solenoid driver board that raises that voltage up once that board's plugged in. So let's look at that board. Uh, that's the next step in it. So what, what were we looking for here? We were looking for voltages that were way too high or that were just completely missing. Now way too high is, uh, you know, a relative term. <laughs> uh, but so the, the display voltage is supposed to be 230 and it told me it was 300. Yeah, that's pretty damn high. I'd, I'd probably try to figure out what's going on with that. The one that's 6.5 and instead it's 7 something, that is high, but I've got a good explanation for it. And I've seen that before. It's typical. Um, they don't have to be exactly right on the money because they're either going to get regulated or they don't need to be regulated. Uh, the one that's the, uh, the play field lamps that's supposed to be 6.9 or whatever, it was something similar to that. So that's cool. The general illumination light. I don't know where Ronnie is on this repair, but I'm going to jump in and try to help him a little bit. Uh, Kevin's waiting on me. He's waiting on me to call him. So I got to get this thing done. So I'm going to go ahead and take all these displays and I'm going to reflow them down on the bottom just to try to save some time for Ronnie. And I'm also going to take the solenoid board out and I'm going to check all these transistors. 
and I'm going to reflow these connectors if they haven't been done. And I got to change these cap, that cap. So that's what I'm going to do. So as you saw, Joey came in earlier and he worked on the displays, reflowed them. We haven't put them in yet. And he worked on this solenoid driver board. Uh, new capacitor, uh, did the couple mods that we always do, cleaned the connectors and resoldered them. He tested all of these transistors. There was one that was bad, swapped it, one of the TIP 102s at the bottom there. Um, so we're to the point now where we're going to plug in our voltage here, which will send that 12 volts from the bottom up to this regulator. And then with nothing else plugged in, none of the outputs plugged in, and none of the other boards plugged in, we're going to test the output of that regulator to make sure that it's turning it into 5 volts. Now, of course, like, a, like we saw earlier, there's only 7 volts on that 12 volt line, so we might have a problem there. Um, but we'll see after we plug it in if that changes. There's a cap here and a cap here, and then this is the filter cap for the 5 volts, so I don't know if all of that's going to change things or not. The display voltage also comes in here and is uses this filter cap here, right? So that 230 that was measuring 180, once we plug it in up here and it's attached to this cap and it's equipment over here basically, it should raise that voltage back up. And then ironically, you use this potentiometer to adjust it back down to 180 because the, the displays want 180, they do not want um, 230. So let me turn it back off and we will plug that in and then measure the voltage there and see if we're getting our five volts. So everything is still unplugged. I've just plugged in this top right connector, which again is gonna send the 12 volts to here and the 230 volts to there. So let's check our display voltage. There are two little test points. You gotta be very careful. You don't wanna to touch other stuff. It's not gonna hurt you or anything but it may uh, short something out. And it might hurt you. 245 volts. So that's the voltage that we were just checking that was 180, but now you've got this capacitor in play, right? 245 volts. That's actually not good. So what that's telling you is that this regulator is not regulating a freaking thing it's shorted together. So we'll have to repair that. Let me kind of turn this little thing. Let's see if that changes anything. Yeah, see no matter where we put that, we're at 245 volts. So that means this is getting 245 in and sending 245 out. If you plug the displays into that, and hopefully nobody has, we haven't, but if you plug the displays into that, you will get really bright LEDs, plasma displays, that will get too bright. <laughs> and then start doing crap you don't want them to do, like burning up. So we've got to mess with this. All right, so here's our test point for the 11.9 that we've only got seven on. And now we have 15.95. How's that, how's that make you feel? Right? <laughs> Remember though, it's unregulated. So it's too low if it's not plugged in and it's too high if it is plugged in. And then the output of the regulator is 5.233 volts. That's about perfect. It's supposed to be five volts, but it, it's a little high so that um, you know, if it loses some voltage with everything plugged in, it, it'll still have a little headroom. And if there's some resistance in the wires or the connections and blah, 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 blah. So it's a little high so that at least 5 volts gets over to the MPU for all of these chips that are going to run the MPU. So the solenoid driver board is doing the 5 volt regulation fine, but the displays are all screwed up. So I'm going to pull it back out and let's look at that section and see if we can figure out why our 245 is not getting turned into 180. Okay, folks, so here is the power supply, that issue where the voltage was too low. 
Um, if you look on this version of the power supply, there are four bridge rectifiers created. Uh, one of them, or two of them, actually use discrete diodes. So the two that use an actual bridge rectifier have a resistor across them as well. And so that's the 6.5 volts for the switched illumination. That was the one that was 7 volts or 7.9 volts, something like that. It's a little high. And then this one is the solenoid voltage. That is the one, um, it also has a resistor on it. That is the one that um, basically was a little high as well. But I guess that's a load, what the resistor is doing. Right, so those those two they were a little high, but they were there. Here's the 230 for the displays. There were four diodes creating that. There's no resistor and no capacitor. It just comes right off the transformer. Right, so that was low. That ended up being like 180. Coming off the transformer, they said there was 170. So it goes through here and now it's 180, and then once it gets to the board, that cap has raised it up to 245. Okay, now down here, we had 14 volts, it says, coming off of the transformer. It goes through the diodes, and instead of 11.5, we had like 7. So I don't know, but now that we've got the board plugged in with the capacitor, we've got like 14. It's a brand new power supply, though, so I don't know. But that's the original design. There must be something a little different with that new power supply compared to the old one. Though. Maybe there's some kind of little safety feature in it or something. So we're going to look at the schematic for the solenoid board, if I can find it. And uh, figure out what our issue is on the display voltage. If I show you the schematic, you'll understand how it works a little better. All right, so it's a it's a fairly simple little setup. From the bridge rectifier, from the transformer's bridge ground. Okay, so this voltage comes in here and it's 230. On ours, it was 180, but once it gets up here and connects to this capacitor, we're at about 245. So we're a little, see how it says plus or minus 27 volts? <laughs> so we're right in there. We're plus or minus 15 volts. We're dead in there. So this is the test point that I'm checking, and I've got 245. Now I'm also checking this test point, and I've also got 245. So this stuff ain't working right. So the voltage should come through there. It's got a resistor. It's got a capacitor. There's a transformer. I mean, a, a transistor here. Uh, a 2N3584 here. There's a diode. Another one, there's another capacitor, another resistor, there is a, a Zener diode. Um, here's our adjustment, and blah, 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 blah. So something in this area is screwed up. So I'm going to use this schematic to test each one of these items and see what I find that's messed up. The first thing I'm going to look at is resistors. They're pretty much the easiest to test, and what often happens is you you find a resistor burn up, and then that tells you that something probably connected to the resistor immediately is screwed up too. So the first resistor is this R35. And by the way, I usually test resistors in circuit. Usually you can tell what's going on by just testing the resistor in circuit. If you're looking you're, we're basically looking for something that's burnt up or shorted whenever we're messing with the resistor. Now watch what happens when I connect to this one. See how that number is falling? I'm going to keep holding it and you see what happens. Watch it's going to get all the way to zero. Oh, I slipped. <laughs> All right, so why is it moving? It's because I'm testing in circuit from here to here. So all I'm doing is I'm charging up this cap with actually the meter. 
So the way these meters work is they send just a little trickle of voltage through one probe and the other probe sees it, and that's how it tests stuff. So it's, it's charging this capacitor up, right? So we're looking to see if this thing's shorted. It looks fine. You can't really tell. Um, it's, it's, not, it's obviously not shorted or it would just be telling me zero from here to here, right? Uh, so I'm going to assume that one's fine. But the only way to test one like that is you would have to take one lead off to get an accurate reading because this cap is going to completely screw you up. But notice that the, this is the ground. Um, once you get past that, you're dealing with the voltage that's just the voltage coming in. Now down here where you're messing with the ground again, you might get a similar thing going on. But um, it's just because this is perfectly across this capacitor. <laughs> right. So moving right along, the next thing that we kind of run into is R51, which is a 22K resistor, it says. And if you look here... R51 is obviously burnt slap up. Now it may not be out of spec yet. We can theorize that it's out of spec because our, our stuff ain't working. So since this isn't working, that's probably a problem. But a lot of times you'll see that and it looks a little charred like that, but it's actually still within tolerance and it's working. Um, so uh, we're probably gonna need to replace that. That may be our whole problem. So R51, like I said, should be 22K, and it is, let's see if I can chop stick it live. Let's just do it live. Well, we're running into a similar situation. It should be 22K. But we can't accurately read it because it's in the board. Okay, we're going to replace it anyway. So let me pull it out and uh, check it. Okay, so believe it or not, that is still in spec, at least when I test it with a multimeter. But it could be that it'll let a little bit of juice through. That little trickle from my meter, which is a milli, 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 milliamp. But it, once you start pumping some, some, some bass through it, it don't like it. And it's not working. So that could be what's going on. So we're going to replace that. I'm going to put this in there. This is a 2 watt, much beefier resistor. But it's the same value, 22K. Okay, so this one looks fine, but we don't know for sure because we haven't pulled it out. This one was fine, but it looked like crap, but we replaced it. Okay, then this one tests in circuit and it tests fine. This one, R52, 390 ohm. If I test it, <laughs> well, if I can get it to do it, there you go. It's testing shorted, 0.2 ohms, less than one ohm. It's supposed to be 390 ohms. So that resistor's bad, right? Well, it sure don't look bad. Okay, so if you've got a little bit of knowledge of electronics or you've messed with this a little bit, you can kind of tell what's going on here. Resistors hardly ever short. They don't usually do that. They open up. So they burn up, and so it, instead of that being 390 ohms, if it started going bad because you're running a bunch of voltage through it, it's going to get hot, and you know, resistance makes, uh, resistance literally <laughs> is, um, a resistor is resisting, you know what I mean? It's not making it easier for voltage to get through, it's resisting the voltage going through so it's got 390 ohms of resistance in it. If it starts screwing up, it's actually going to raise, usually. Now, there are exceptions, but 99.9 .9 times out of 100, a resistor, if it goes bad, it's going to open. It's not going to short. Some can short, but most don't. So now we're, we're faced with one that seems shorted. So if you, if you know a little bit about how that works, then you would go, hmm, don't think so. Resistors don't usually short, and that one looks pretty good. It doesn't look like it's all screwed up. So if you look at your schematics, you see that that resistor, one side is connected to here, and one side 
is connected to here. So if this Q21 was screwed up, like so let's say it was shorted, it would make this resistor appear shorted. And since we know that resistors don't usually short, since this junction is testing shorted, and we know that transistors short all the damn time, it's much more likely that this transistor shorted than this resistor shorted. So we're going to remove Q21, even though we're testing that this is shorted. Now you could, to make it even slower than I'm making it, you could remove the resistor and test it out of circuit. But you, you know, you can kind of take a shortcut because you know that fact that usually resistors go up in value, they don't go down in value. They certainly don't go down to dead shorts, hardly ever. Now, this could be the first time in the history of recorded uh, YouTube videos that that's wrong, <laughs> but probably not. So, I'm going to, and like I said, transistors go bad all the freaking time. Transistors short a lot, diodes short a lot, capacitors short from time to time, uh, resistors hardly ever short. So, we're going to remove Q21, get it out of the circuit, and then retest R52 with Q21 removed. So we're, we're kind of doing it backwards than how you might think because uh, my hunch is that's bad. So I've removed it and uh, it is dead shorted. And when I test my resistor now, I get 388 ohms. So um, again, this is an active part. You know, a resistor is, is it just lays there. This is something that actually has to do something inside of here. I don't know. There's some kind of magic going on inside of there, and it ain't working no more. Whatever's in here done died. So this is done. So it's a 2N3584. Okay. Now that's not what this says. So at the top you have the Motorola logo. And at the bottom it says 7752. Now where have you heard 52 before? This That's a date code. This would have been made the last week, the 52nd week of 1977. When this Motorola made this device. This is probably a 2N3584 like it says on the schematics. But it doesn't say that, does it? It says 585-42. This is back from the time when, uh, you know, they were still inventing all the kinds of stuff. <laughs> it seems that we don't invent much anymore anywhere in the world. But back then, you know, a lot of this electronic stuff was new. And they were just inventing stuff like Mad Men and Mad Women. And Motorola chose to make up their own part numbers. So you would have no way of no looking at this and knowing what it actually is. It's a 2N3584. There's nothing on there that suggests that. That's just how Motorola did it. The other companies did similar things, but usually it was more decipherable. Like they would add an N to the end or uh, uh, an N to the beginning or something. But nope, Motorola had to completely reinvent the wheel. You know, But that's just how they did things the whole time they were in business, I believe. Okay, so another thing, many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, all these games came out in the late 70s, early 80s, this particular series of games. So around, you know, late 90s, mid 90s, late 90s, people started getting these in their houses. They would figure out a way to get one from an operator that went out of business or something. And, you know, some people had them from the beginning, but the, the hobby of fixing these, this era... Is from the 90s and on. So you used to have tons of websites and stuff like that, in the 2000s at least, where you could buy parts to fix these. That's all kind of changed. There were a couple really good ones where they would sell like a little kit just to rebuild this area. And it would have the cap, the resistors that burn up, this, this, and this, a new fuse holder, a new little thing. And it'd be like $7 or something, you know. And... um Unfortunately, I don't know of any place that still does that. Because what happened was they redesigned the board, or they, they made a new board that you can buy that's like 150 bucks, And it's gotten to the point where a lot of people, they don't want to take the time to fix this stuff. They just want to buy the new board and put in it, which is understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. But they don't make very good YouTube videos. right? So what I'm doing by repairing this is what everybody did 
10, 15 years ago. But time marches on, folks. So now people are getting in their house uh, Stern games that have like the, what are they, the white star board, I think they call it. Uh, and they act like that's old, right? Because it's just the nature of time. But this is the stuff that people used to fix, right? So if you need stuff for a Stern game, there may be places that sell little kits to fix little things, right? But this early um, solid state stuff, there's less and less of that. But thankfully, I have that part, I believe, hopefully. Um, you just have to, yeah, but a place like, like here where we work on a lot of them, we just, whenever we need something, I just buy 10 of them whenever I buy one. And sometimes you buy them and they're fake parts and you have to go find them somewhere else. But I've been able to track down most of this stuff. So um, I'm going to pop a new one in and that will be that. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Uh-huh. I got one left. Uh-huh. Time to order some more. All right. So I've replaced that. It now, this, everything tests fine, okay? This diode is also suspect. You know, it's attached right to it. That diode is, is testing fine. Now, you may wonder, well, why didn't the fuse blow, blah, 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 blah. Well, where, look where the fuse is. It's on the output just before it goes to the displays. So if you start pulling a bunch of current from the displays, it will blow that fuse. But this over here can be all screwed up, and it won't blow the fuse. Now, if you get a situation where something shorted to ground, uh, it would probably blow the fuse back on the power supply, right? Um, but you can have all kinds of problems. So, you've got these other two transistors, which are 2N3440s, right? And if we test those, we still have problems. So, if you look real close at them, see how it says BCE? So you can test these just like you test a, you know, just a normal transistor. Let's see here. Let's see if I can get it to show you anything. So between the base and the emitter, 0.7. Between the base and the collector, dead short. <laughs> So, this one seems to be shorted. Base and emitter, 0.7. Base and collector, dead short on a diode test. So, we're going to swap in another 2N3440. Okay, so our final scorecard. This thing was burnt all to crap. This had shorted. And this one had opened up. You would think it'd be that way. You'd think that one would be shorted. But I guess since this was shorted, and by the way, this one, all three legs were shorted together. So this 245 volts that was here was just shorting through the transformer, the transistor, and you had 245 volts over here. And, and I've had people getting on me because I call all of these transistors. People, a voltage regulator, that's a transistor if it's in that case. Look at the look at the spec sheet. You'll, you'll see. Okay. So anyway, um, I call them transistors. Deal with it, folks. Deal with it. You're not watching me to get proper nomenclature. If you are, you're foolish. Okay. So this one was shorted. This one was shorted. This one was open. So that's kind of expensive. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but everything else tests out. Now the last thing that we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to replace something else. So, so far it's one resistor, three transistors. We're also going to replace this. So there is a little adjustment. It's a 25K um, adjustment. Okay. Potentiometer. There we go. Trimmer pot. These things are junk. Oh, they're horrible. Look how they get all bent up. They can even, the legs can touch each other on the back and all that. No, you don't want that, folks. That thing's a piece of junk. 
So it often gets screwed up. So um, if you have no voltage, your no display voltage, it could be that thing. That thing is junk. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to replace that with a brand new. One. All right, I've replaced it now. That other one had a thumb wheel, which makes it easier to uh, adjust. Right, those are hard to find though, and you don't really need to be able to adjust that easily. You need to adjust it one time and leave it alone. It's not like you turn the display voltage up and down. Um, so we're going to have to make do with that. Notice it says 190 volts DC to the displays. That's the original spec. They wanted it at 190 volts. Many years ago, people decided that that was a little too hot. Uh, you have a you end up with an issue where if the if the displays get too high of a voltage, it burns them slap the hell up. You can even see it burn them up. It causes little spots on the displays. I'm sure some of these will probably have some of it. I'll show you that on the next video. Um, but 190 is a little too high. You're better off putting it at about 180. So that's what we're going to aim for, right? So I have just, I don't have any way to measure it on the bench easily. So I'll just set it in the middle. And uh, the displays aren't going to be hooked up yet. So we're going to put it in the cabinet and then adjust that to 180. And we should be able to adjust it now. Before we were getting uh, 245, 245 on test point four which is that top one. That's the voltage coming in. And then we were also getting 245 on test point two, the bottom one, which is the voltage that should be regulated, right? So uh, that's where we're at. All right, folks, so we've got her back in there. So new, three new transistors. <laughs> the fuse was still fine. Left the one resistor, I think it's fine. Replace the other resistor. This uh, capacitor up here, you can replace it if you want, but you usually don't have to. All it does is, uh, if you get some ripple on the line going to the displays, you will see like a little bit of a like a wave in the displays. So if it's doing that and you don't like it, replace that cap. But it's usually not doing that. So... Now, like I said, this one's a little hot. 247. We were at 245 before. And then our regulated voltage, 172.5. That's pretty close. All right, I turned it up a little bit more with the screwdriver. And now we've got 179.9. That's close enough for me. 170 is a little low. It, it, you might start seeing some problems where they don't light up quite right. Okay, so I think we've got that ready to go. But like I was saying, if you put in LEDs, you don't even need that. They run on 5 volts, so they don't need the 180 volt supply. But this particular game is going to have the original displays in it, so we need it. So there you go. That's the old school way of fixing the old school display section <laughs> i hope you enjoyed it leave your comments below make sure to check out we now have two other channels did you know that so we have one channel called amateur repair time that's the that's the stuff i've been doing on the weekends where i work on old radios old clocks old record players old film projectors all the cool vintage electronic stuff so we're over there having a blast. We've been, I've been putting those videos up on Sundays on this channel, but eventually we're going to split them off where they're all on their own channel. So we've uploaded a whole bunch of them over there. So go check that out if you haven't already. It's Amateur Repair Time here on YouTube. The whole point of that channel is to show you that anybody can fix this stuff. If I can do it, you can do it. Because I don't even know what I'm doing when it comes to radios at least. Um, but I you know, hobble through it and figure it out. It can be done. So the same thing with these pinball machines. If you try, you can probably do it. Uh, and then our other channel, of course, is my brother Donnie. My brother Donnie has his own channel here on YouTube. Joey and I work on arcade games, pinball machines, and jukeboxes, but our brother Donnie is more into old buildings, old vehicles, and cows. He's got a farm with cows, chickens, goats, all that stuff. <laughs> 
so we have a good time over there on his channel. I'm over there a lot. If you haven't seen it, go subscribe to him. But we will see you back here in a couple days where we'll keep working through the boards on this beautiful 8-Ball Deluxe Limited Edition. Hopefully we'll get it to, uh, to boot up or do something. I mean, at least we got the lights on this time, right? So uh, we'll see you on the next one. Hope you enjoyed it.